Hey, you may be seated. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Brian. It's great to be here with you today. Open up to the Gospel of Mark. We've been studying Mark for over a year, and we're almost done. This is our last week in Mark. Today, we're starting chapter 15. On Friday night, if you join us for Good Friday, we're going to do the Good Friday passages at the end of chapter 15, and then next Sunday on Easter. Remember, different service times, but on Easter next Sunday, we're going to be um, we're going to be finishing up the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16. And here's how it ends. For those of you who don't know, Jesus, he's going to die, but he's going to rise from the dead. So that's pretty exciting. That's where we're going. Sorry if you didn't know that, but that's what we're, that's what we're celebrating this next week. Today, though, we're going we're gonna to pick up in chapter 15. And, and what we're going to look at today is this interaction between Jesus and Pilate. If you watched last week's message, if you were here last week, we talked about Jesus standing before the high priest, the Jewish high priest, and they're putting him on trial. It was a sham trial. And then what happened next is, is he gets sent to Pilate. And Pilate isn't Jewish. Pilate is the Roman governor. And he, the reason he has to go to Pilate is because Pilate has, was the one who had the authority to put him to death, which is what the, what the Sanhedrin was trying to accomplish. So last week's trial was kind of the trial of Jesus, part one. Today, it's the trial of Jesus, part two. And we're, look at, we're gonna look at six questions of Pilate, the Roman governor, six questions of Pilate today from Mark chapter 15. So again, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, turn there. There are six in the Gospel of Mark, but there's one more really important question that John gives us in John's Gospel, John 18. So I wanna start with the seventh question of Pilate today from the Gospel of John before we get to our text in Mark. And here's what, here's what Pilate asked Jesus. It's, so, it's so, such a powerful statement for someone to make. Pilate just asked him this question. What is truth? What is truth? What a great question for a politician to ask. Don't you wish our politicians would ask this question? Don't you wish that people in culture today, influencers in society today would ask this question, what is truth? In, post in the postmodern world, we don't believe in truth anymore. The, the, the secular world, the outside world, now we believe in truth here in the church, but have you noticed, if you're a follower of Jesus, have you noticed just how weird it's getting out there? How nonsensical it's getting out there? No one believes in truth anymore. And to prove it, I asked Chat GPT, what is truth? Here's what Chat GPT, if those of you who don't know, this is artificial intelligence. Yes, it's coming for all of us. And here's, here's Chat GPT's answer. Postmodernism challenges traditional notions of truth by suggesting that truth is not objective and universal but rather subjective and context dependent. Isn't that how the world views it today? It goes on. In this view, truth is not a fixed reality waiting to be discovered, but rather a product of social, historical, and cultural influences. Postmodernists argue that different groups or individuals may have their own truths that are valid within their own frameworks or perspectives, and that these truths are not necessarily in conflict with each other. That's what our world believes about truth. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Pilate's question from 2,000 years ago is still ringing out in our culture today, isn't it? And just like 2,000 years ago, we're going to see where Pilate landed, by the way, on this. We're going to see what, Pilate, what conclusion Pilate came to. And you're going to have an opportunity to come to your own conclusion as well. We're going to see what the Bible says about it. But this question today, I think, is a question everyone needs to grapple with. Do you believe in truth or not? Do you believe there is truth? There is, there's not just like a bunch of different perspectives, and everyone can have their own perspective, and everyone's perspective can be right, depending on your context, depending on your opinion, but actually our definition of sin is sin is trusting and acting on your own opinions above God's truth. So see, we believe that there is truth. If you're here today and you're kind of just dipping your toe in the water and you're trying to figure out if you wanna to go to this church or if you wanna follow the Jesus of the Bible, I'm just gonna to cut to the chase and tell you this. Look, the Bible gives you 
a foundation. The Bible, the Bible gives you truth that you can trust in, that you can rely in. And we're gonna see that in the, in the context of Pilate's discussion with Jesus today. Here's our question that's gonna drive us today. We're gonna answer this question. How will you handle the truth about Jesus? How will you handle the truth about Jesus? Pilate, Pilate had to figure this out. Pilate is going to be judging Jesus. Last week we talked about how the high priest was judging Jesus and how the irony of that is that Jesus is the ultimate judge, but Jesus let the high priest judge him. The high priest was wrong, but Jesus let the high priest judge him. And today we're going to look at Pilate. And Pilate, the irony is, He's standing in front of Pilate now, and Jesus is going to let Pilate judge him, even though Jesus is the judge of all. And the truth is that Jesus lets you judge him. Jesus lets you make your own decisions about him. He, I mean, that's, that's the responsibility of, of every one of us, is we have to decide what we're going to believe about Jesus. Here's, here's what Pilate decided. Mark chapter 15. It says this, very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council. So last week, we told you the fancy word for this. The word for this is the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin was made up of 71 members. They were the kind of the Jewish Supreme Court, the ruling council. And these are the guys that had just put him on trial at the end of chapter 14. And now here they are. They're bringing, they're bringing Jesus, or they're coming together to discuss their next step. And they bound Jesus, they led him away, and they took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Okay, so he's standing before Pilate. Now we have a little bit more about Pilate. The most context we have about Pilate is from these verses here and the, and the parallel passages in the other gospels. But there's another place in, in the in the Bible where it says Pilate was kind of a bad guy. He kind of got in trouble. He did some bad stuff. The Jews weren't big fans of Pilate, okay? Go figure that you're not a big fan of the politicians. I don't, I've never heard of that before. I think we all love our politicians, all of them. But it, I guess back then it was different. So anyway, Pilate wasn't, Pilate, Pilate, there was no love lost, lost between Pilate and the Jewish people. But they still had to bring Jesus to Pilate because he was the Roman governor and the Romans were the ones that had authority to do crucifixion. Crucifixion is a Roman execution. The Jews, the Sanhedrin, had no authority to crucify anybody. They had to go through Pilate to get it done. And so they bring him to Pilate, and Pilate asks Jesus this. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you have said it. A couple things about this. First of all, this is gonna show up five more times in Mark 15. So if you're reading on your own this week at home, I encourage you to do that, to read Mark 15. You can play a little Where's Waldo with this phrase. You'll find it five more times in Mark chapter 15, this king of the Jews. We're gonna see it a few more times today as we read the text. The second thing that's interesting about this is just the, just the fact that this is the question that Pilate is asking. Isn't it interesting that Pilate's not saying, are you the Messiah? Because Messiah is a Jewish concept. It's not a Roman concept. Pilate doesn't care if Jesus thinks he's Messiah. There were plenty of other Messiahs, people who claimed to be Messiahs. He didn't care about like rescuing the Israelites. Like who cares about that for a Roman? He doesn't care. But king of the Jews mattered to Pilate. Because the king of the Romans, the king of all the people in, in Jerusalem, Judea, the Israelites were under Roman rule at this time. Their king was supposed to be Caesar, right? Their king was supposed to be Caesar. And so what Pilate was interested in is, do you think you're the king of the Jews? Are you claiming to be their king instead of Caesar being their king? That's why Pilate keeps asking this question. He's interested in Jesus' answer to this question. But there's one more thing I have to say about this, and it's the wording. We talked about this last week. The wording of this in the original language. Now, in our translation here in the, in the NLT, it just puts it into the form of a regular question. Are you the king of the Jews? But actually, if you read the original language, the original manuscripts, Mark frames it a little bit differently. He says this. Pilate, in the original language, Pilate is saying this. You're the king of the Jews, eh? It's like Canadian, you know? 
Canadian pilot. Now, is it, but here's why that's interesting. Because stating it like that doesn't just make you sound Canadian. It actually puts the confession of the truth into your mouth. He says, you're the king of the Jews. Huh? And that's exactly what, what Mark does to the high priest. Last week, the high priest said, asked the same question, are you the son of God? But in our text, it said, are you the son of God? But actually in the original manuscript, it says, you're the son of God, eh? So see what, what's happening, and pay attention to this on Good Friday, if you come on Friday night, because the Roman soldier is gonna confess Jesus to be the son of God as well. It's so interesting that the high priest last week confesses, unknowingly confesses that Jesus is who the Bible says he is. And now Pilate, the way Mark forms it, Pilate is actually confessing. He's an unknown confessor to the identity of Jesus. And then on Friday night, we're gonna see the Roman soldier is gonna do it as well. And it reminds me of this passage from Philippians that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the thing. You get to decide what you believe about Jesus now, but there's gonna come a day when you're gonna confess it. That's what the Bible says. That, that he gives us the ability to make our own choice, make our own decision, but, there's gonna come, but, there, but that doesn't mean there are a bunch of different truths about it. That doesn't mean that, well, well if, you, if you see Jesus this way, then that's how Jesus is. And if, if, this per, if this side of the crowd sees Jesus this way, then that's how Jesus is. And if this religion you grew up in sees Jesus this way, then that's fine. That's how Jesus is. No, there's only one Jesus. And someday everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Someday everyone will be forced to confess it. Every knee will bow to Jesus. Someday that's gonna happen. Even though right now, you get to think what you want. He's not gonna force you to confess him just yet. And so see, for me, this is why this sermon's so important. This message and Pilate's example is so important because it's so much better for you if you confess Jesus as Lord while you're on this earth, while you're alive, because the Bible says that the most important thing about you is what you believe about Jesus and what you confess about Jesus. And then if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. And if you don't, then you won't. That's why this whole thing is so important. And what we see on Friday night and what we see on, on Sunday morning next week in Easter, it's so important that we align ourselves with what God's word says about the truth rather than just kind of pulling a chat GPT and just doing whatever we want and seeing it however we want to. Man, it's so important that you confess Jesus as Lord. I hope you see that as we go through the text today. So back to the text, Mark 15, verse three, it says the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. We saw that last week. So they're still doing it. Now they're doing it in front of Pilate. And Pilate asked him, so here's, here's one of Pilate's questions in the book of Mark. This, if you're keeping track, this is question number two. So question one was, are you the king of the Jews? Question two is, aren't you gonna answer them? Like they're throwing all these these darts at you, they're lying about you, they're accusing you of these crimes, aren't you gonna answer them? Question three, what about all these charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Jesus was, Jesus was quiet, like, and in, in it's, he's fulfilling a prophecy from Isaiah 53, like a lamb, like a sheep before its shears, before its murderers is silent. So Jesus was just led away. He was just quiet. He was just quiet. He didn't say anything. I don't know what kind of person does this. Because I know for me, if someone's accusing me of stuff, if someone is falsely accusing me, and I shared this last week, that that, that happened years ago. Someone literally sat in my in my living room and accused me of stuff, like falsely accused me of stuff. And I, I, how frustrated I felt. And Tracy put him in a headlock before he left. I mean, it was, it was awesome. But, and we saw that last week that, that Jesus is being accused. This is now his second trial where he's being falsely accused and nobody is speaking up for him. And I remember back five, six years ago when this was happening to me, I was def at one particular meeting, I was defending myself so strongly. And, and one of my good friends grabbed me afterward and he said, you don't have to defend yourself. 
He said, the truth will come out. Don't worry about it. You, you, like, you don't have to bend over backwards. They're not gonna believe. If, if they're gonna believe you, they'll believe you. If they're not, they're not. But the truth is gonna come out. They'll, you'll, you will be vindicated someday. And that was so good for me to hear. By the way, if you're here today and you feel like that's been happening to you, like, take a lesson from Jesus here. Jesus is just quiet. He doesn't say anything. He's just quiet. Because Jesus is not insecure like me and you. There's something in me that's like, I gotta know that you believe the truth about me. There's something in me that, that validates me that you know the truth about me, but that's not in Jesus. Jesus doesn't need to be validated by you. Your belief about Jesus isn't gonna change the truth about Jesus. What you think about Jesus is not gonna change reality one bit, not a bit for Jesus. It will for you, but it won't change anything for Jesus. Jesus doesn't need you to confess the truth about him so that he could feel good about himself. Jesus feels pretty good about himself already. He's not insecure. He knows who he is. And so when Jesus is being falsely accused again, he's just quiet. He doesn't say a word. Now, verse six, it says, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner. And then anyone that the people requested and one of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who, who was, he was guilty of murder. Okay, so he, he murdered, he created this uprising. Barabbas was kind of like a Messiah figure, by the way. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Barabbas was a Messiah. He was a revolutionary, which is what so many of Jesus' followers wanted him to be. But Jesus was like, I'm not a revolutionary. Jesus, Jesus, that's not what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to, to fulfill the expectations of the Jewish people of an earthly Messiah that was going to like lead the Jews to, to victory over Rome. Jesus is like, that's not what this is about. But Barabbas maybe was one of those guys that it was about. And so this, here's a guy that deserved to die, clearly deserved to die. And so that's why Mark shows us that this was one of the options. It says the, the crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. And, and Pilate says this, would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? He says it again. There's number two for those of you who are playing Where's Waldo today. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? For he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. So Pilate's like, he's kind of like seeing this whole thing play out. And he's like, I see what's going on here. I'm kind of partial to Pilate, by the way. I don't know how you feel. I've, I've always, since I was young, I would read this story. I'm like, Pilate seems like a truth seeker to me. Pilate seems like a guy, yeah, he's on the fence. But it seem, when I read this, it seems to me like Pilate is genuinely just trying to figure out the truth here. Now, maybe I'm being too gracious to him. I'm being too generous, but that's how I've always read it. And he's kind of putting two and two together. I mean, he doesn't have a dog in the fight. He doesn't want to be in this place. He doesn't want to have to make this judgment, but it's his job and he has to. And so, so he's giving them an out. He's giving the people an out. Hey, would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Can you believe that? A known murderer and the leading priests are stirring up the crowd to let this murderer out among their families. Let the murderer out. Let's kill Jesus instead. And Pilate asked the people, then what should I do with this man that you call the king of the Jews? I'm noticing something here with Pilate, by the way. Maybe this is just me, but it seems like maybe he's distancing himself a little bit now from the situation. Maybe he's not comfortable being in this place where the fate of this guy is like in his hands. One of the other Gospel narratives tells us that he washed his hand, literally washed his hands like, I don't even want anything to do with this. Some of you might feel that way right now too. I said earlier, the most important thing about you is what you believe about Jesus because what you believe about Jesus will determine your eternal destiny. And some of you are like, that's too much for a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Like I am not ready for a decision like that. 
see, see my wife, please. Talk to she. Church is my wife's thing. That's her thing. Some of you, some of you husbands are thinking that. Like I just ah. Look, men, you will not be able to hide behind your wife on Judgment Day. Kids, teenagers, your parents aren't going to be standing there with you on Judgment Day. Like you will, you will stand before God and he will ask one question. What did you do with the Jesus question? What did you think about Jesus? Did you confess the name of Jesus while you had a chance? Because you won't have an opportunity afterward. That day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, the, that's talking about being subjected and admitting the truth even though you didn't admit it when you were here on earth and those people will be judged. So we're all going to have to be in the seat of Pilate. I mean, Pilate is representative of, of a spiritual seeker. It's all of us. He represents all of us. That's why this is such a compelling story to me. Because here's a guy on the fence, and he's trying to, like, push it off on someone else. What do you want me to do with this guy? I don't want to do it. Like, I, whatever. Like, he seems fine to me. He seems innocent to me. Why don't you take Barabbas instead? Like, I'm giving you every chance here. Like, I don't want to make this decision. This is too big of a decision. This is, this is, this is too weighty for me. He keeps, he keeps, like, avoiding this. But verse 13 says that they shouted back, crucify him. And he's like, why? See, this is, I don't, I've lost count. This is question number four or five by now, Okay. Now he's not talking to Jesus. Now he's talking to the crowd. Why? What crime has he committed? And by the way, he hasn't com committed any crimes. If, you, if you're new to the Bible, look, one quick thing about Jesus. He's perfect and sinless. Now that's not true of us. We're all imperfect and sinful, except for those who serve in kids' church. <laughs> but all the rest of us are imperfect and sinful. I'm, Holly, I'm doing my best here. I'm doing my best. Jesus committed no crime. When Jesus went to the cross, which we'll celebrate on Friday this week, Jesus wasn't there for his sins. He was there for your sins and my sins. Jesus committed no crime. And it's almost like Pilate is beginning to see this, like he recognized, he's starting to see some of the truth about Jesus. What crime has he committed? I don't understand it. I don't see the problem with this guy. But it says the mob roared even louder Crucify him. Isn't it interesting that Mark calls the crowd now the mob? The crowd has turned into a mob. And man, is it hard to stand for Jesus when the mob is standing against Jesus. And for some of you, this, this, for some of you Christians in here, that might be how you feel right now at school or at work or on base or whatever. It's just like, I'm trying to stand for Jesus, but Man, it's like we live in a culture where the mob is against Jesus. It's like Jesus is the only one who can't have an opinion anymore. You know, if I'm like, well, here's why I believe this about that, it's because Jesus said it. Well, sorry, that's hate speech or whatever. I won't get into the details of it. Talk to me afterward about it if you want to, but it drives me nuts, the nonsense in our culture. And here Pilate is, and the mob is yelling, crucify him. And it's really interesting what Mark says in verse 15. It's our last verse for today. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. To pacify the crowd. And he ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip and then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. That's where we'll pick it up on Friday night, on Good Friday. But I just want to point out that Pilate made his decision. Pilate made his decision. You could see him battling and wrestling for a dozen verses, like trying to figure this out, trying to get to the bottom of it. And some of you, maybe that's where you are. Like you've been wrestling. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while. Maybe you've been, you've been searching, you've been reading the Bible, and you, but you're still a little bit on the fence. You still haven't made a decision. Well, Pilate made his decision and his decision was made to pacify the crowd. And he made the wrong decision. And so when, when Pilate said in John 18, 38, what is truth? 
I wanted to give you the context for his question because John gives us, this is verse 38. I want to show you verse 37. Pilate was asking this question of Jesus because Jesus said this, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. And all who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And that's when Pilate said, what is truth? I don't even know what you're talking about, Jesus. Can we even be sure of anything anymore? What is truth? But Jesus just said, truth is found in him. If you wanna know truth, look to Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That's the truth about Jesus. If, if you wanna know truth, it starts with the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's no other anchor for answering Pilate's question than Jesus. Jesus is the truth teller. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you wanna experience the freedom that can come, it can only come through Jesus. So the question, how will you handle the truth about Jesus? Man, that is such a big question. Pilate mishandled it. Pilate weighed it and Pilate made the wrong choice. And I hope today, if you're here and you're, you're interested in knowing the truth, I hope you would look to Jesus for it. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that today you would reveal yourself to the person who is on the fence. I know that there are people in a crowd like this today or people watching online. I know that there are people who really do feel like they're in the seat of Pilate, that they're in, they're in the... They're in the seat of making a decision and that is such an important decision to be made. And Jesus, I pray that you would reveal yourself. I pray that you would tell the doubter. I pray that you would communicate to the skeptic that you are who you say you are, that you are trustworthy and true and that in fact, all truth is rooted in you. All truth starts with you, Jesus, because you're the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray for the person who is looking for that, who's trying to find that, God, I pray that they would find you. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.